Hello and good morning. I want to welcome everyone to our webinar today on the election to apply the research credit against payroll tax. Before we get started, I do want to go ahead and take care of some housekeeping items. You can maximize or minimize the webinar pane during the presentation by using the red and orange arrow buttons. During the webinar, we also encourage you to ask questions. In the webinar pane, you'll see a questions box that you can use to type in your questions and click submit. Our presenters are going to be answering those questions during the webinar at the end, sorry, at the end of our webinar as time allows. Um, and then also I want to make sure that you have good audio. So if you're using a telephone, please select the phone call audio option. If you're using your computer, make sure you're selecting the computer audio option. And then I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to David Sheets. Um, and our presenters are going to be presenting themselves today. Good morning, everyone. I'm David Sheets, tax partner in the San Jose office. I've been consulting to startup companies here in Silicon Valley for over 20 years. And I spent time as a controller with one during the dot-com days. Last year, I assisted 35 companies in obtaining over $5 million in payroll tax refunds. And it was an average of $150,000 per company. So that's what we're talking about today. And I look forward to going over this information with you. Uh, my name is Chris Beasley. I'm uh, one of the tax partners in the Armanino tax practice. Um, while I am a, more of a generalist than David is, I am here to more assist him from an emotional level throughout the uh, webinar. So uh, David is going to be doing most of the presenting here and I will be kind of fielding questions as we go along. So thank you for joining us. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, just to give you an overview of their presentation, they're going to be going over a legislative update, research credit overview, um, also qualified research, and small business payroll tax offset. Um, so take it away, guys. Yes, yeah, so uh, with the PATH Act that was signed into law at the end of 2015, uh, it permanently extended the research credit. Uh, so this, this was a very good thing because in the past, it had always been an expiring credit. So Congress would have to you know, extend it you know, every few years. And so it made tax planning very difficult as you, you didn't know whether uh, the credit was gonna be extended or not. Sometimes it was extended after the end of the tax year. Uh, but now it's uh, permanent um, addition to the, to the code. So, um, and, and also included with that, uh, PATH Act was a couple of provisions. Um, one was that eligible small businesses are allowed to use the research credits against AMT. So eligible small businesses are businesses with less than 50 million in gross receipts. And then the, the one provision we're going to hit on today, which is the qualified small businesses can use research credits to offset uh, their employer payroll taxes. And then just recently in the Tax Reform Act, um, there is uh, uh, there, there was some concern whether they were going to continue the R&D credit or they were gonna, how it was going to be impacted, and thankfully uh, the they preserved the R&D credit. So we'll just go through a brief overview of the research credit. So there is a regular credit that gets calculated, and there's an alternative simplified credit, and any unused credits may be carried back one year or carried forward 20. The re regular credit method is the method that I see most of the time um, startups using. Uh, the alternative simplified method uh, relies on a history of qualified research expenses or QREs, but since a lot of startups that working with don't have that history, uh, that, that makes that method ineffective. And so typically we we see the research credit uh, method being used. So this method is a 20% of the excess of qualified research expenses uh, for the tax year over a base amount. And the base amount is uh, a fixed base percentage multiplied by the average gross receipts for the prior four tax years, uh, but cannot be less than 50% of the QREs for the credit years. So this is called the minimum base amount. So as, as you could see, um, if you have uh, 
a 20% rate multiplied by 50% of your QREs, you just want to think 10% of your QREs will likely be your credit amount. So here's an example. A uh, company has total QREs of $3 million and their fixed base percentage uh, for startups for the first five years is a 3% rate. And they have average gross sheets a year in this example of a million dollars. So their base amount is the 3% multiplied by the million of average gross receipts due to a base amount of 30,000. Uh, but it can't be less than the minimum base amount, which is 50% of the QREs which here the minimum base amount would be 1.5 million. So your QRE less the base amount is the one is 1.5 million. And you multiply that by 20% and you get a $300,000 gross credit. So as you can see, the total QRE is 3 million, gross credit 300,000 is 10%. Um, you, you can elect a reduced credit and you'd probably ask, well, why would I want to reduce my credit? And, and in case of startups applying for the, the payroll or electing the payroll tax refund, I would I would agree with that 100%. Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to reduce the refund dollars that you were going to receive. The reduced credit was put in place because if you use the gross credit, you must reduce your expenses by the amount of the credit. So, for example, you're a startup company with two a two million dollar um, net operating loss for the year, and you calculate a gross credit of three hundred thousand. Um, you would need to add back 300,000. So now your net operating loss would be 1.7. Um, but that's that's not a, you know, a big deal because you know, obviously you're going to be um, getting 300,000 or, 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 or you're going to get a lot of that as a payroll tax refund. You don't want to reduce that amount. Um, so the reduced credit came into play because um, you don't have to reduce, you reduce your credit, but you don't have to reduce your expenses. And so for companies that are paying the top corporate rate, which is you know, 35%, uh, you would reduce your credit, you know, which, which you reduce it to 65%, you come out, you, you come out the same, um, there, there's no impact tax-wise, but it just allows you that, that option to you know, take a gross credit or reduced credit. But for most of the startups, you're gonna be taking, you'll be, you'll be taking the, uh, the gross credit. So we'll go through what qualified research is, and that is defined as a four-part test. The first test is you need to discover information uh, to un un eliminate an uncertainty. And an uncertainty exists if information available to you does not establish the capability or method for developing or improving the product or the appropriate design of the product. So there just needs to be some, you're discovering information to eliminate something that you don't have the information on. Um, and it must and it must be technological in nature. That's the second test. Uh, so that means that you're discovering information that fundamentally relies on the hard sciences. So that's uh, physical or biological sciences, engineering, uh, computer science. It can't be based on arts, humanities, social sciences. The third test, the business component test. So you're discovering information that is technological in nature in order uh, for a purpose to um, be intended to be used, for a qualified person intended to be used for a new or improved business component. And so that's basically what, what you're offering to sell or a service that you're offering, um, that, that the research is going towards that. And it relates to a qualified person, relates to a new or improved function, performance, or reliability or quality. Now the fourth test here is the process of experimentation test. And this is the most important test. Um, this is the, there needs to be an uncertainty and then you identify one or more alternatives in order to eliminate that uncertainty. And you must evaluate those alternatives uh, through some sort of process of experimentation. So that could be um, you know, modeling, simulation, systematic trial and error iterations. And so you, um, and so substantially all of the activities must con con constitute elements of process experimentation for the qualified purpose. So you must meet all four of these tests in order to be considered doing qualified research. And then we've gone through the qualified research um, four part test. There's a list here of the non-qualified activities. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, but just point out some of the ones that I see as um, 
working with the, the startup companies. Um, and it's the first one here is um, any research related to the adaptation of an existing business component to a particular customer's requirement or need. So that means that you've already you already have something that you've already developed, and now you're doing R and D in order to fit it to a specific customer's um, need, and that that would be non-qualified. That portion of it would be non-qualified. And continuing on here, um, the other one we see a lot is any research conducted outside the United States. So if a company has a development team, say in India, um, and they're they're doing development work there. Um, those costs would not be considered uh, qualified. Those would be non-qualified costs. And then any research to the extent funded by any grant, contract, or otherwise by another person or governmental entity. So if you're being paid for the research work that you're doing, um, then that would be a non-qualified activity. Um, but if you meet two kind of requirements that you're at risk, um, you know, so um, so you, you're going to get paid based on maybe on a milestone that you have to reach, or that um, or the, and you must also have substantial rights to the IP that's being developed. In those cases there, then potentially you could uh, have it as qualified. So we talked about the four-part test, the non-qualified activities. Um, so what expenses go into the um, calculation of the credit? It's, it's, it's these items here, which is wages paid or incurred to an employee for qualified services. Uh, and, uh, and it's supplies used in the conduct of qualified research. It's computers rent or lease used in qualified uh, research, which, uh, you know, this, the computers rent or lease was put in the code a long time ago when people, not everyone had computers, and you go rent or lease someone's computer to do your research, and the government allowed you to use that as a qualified research expense. Uh, but, uh, but nowadays, we see companies using Amazon Web Services or Google Services, and essentially what you're doing is you're renting and leasing those uh, servers uh, in order to do your qualified research. That could be a, a qualified research expense. Uh, you can also use 65% of contract research costs. Um, and so for startup companies that are pre-revenue, um, there is an interpretation um, that says that if you are pre-revenue, uh, that you're not carrying on a trade or business and therefore your contract research uh, costs are not a qualified research expense. Um, so the, uh, the, the other interpretation is that only once you start receiving gross receipts from the sale of your product are you carrying on a trade or business. So just, just be aware of, uh, of, of that rule. Um, so now we can dive into the small business payroll tax offset. So who does this apply to? It applies to qualified small businesses defined as having gross receipts less than $5 million in 2017 and must have had no gross receipts before 2013 <clears throat> um, and can only have gross receipts. So basically, in other words, can only have gross receipts in the last five years. So for, and this, this five-year window moves each year. So for last year, 2016, um, you must have, you know, less than $5 million in gross receipts in 2016. You must have had no gross receipts before 2012. <clears throat> um, qualified small businesses include C corporations, S corporations, partnerships, and individuals. And the control group rules do apply, so please keep those in mind. And so the definition of gross receipts, um, there was different interpretations um, that looking at last year, but then IRS came along and clarified it with a notice 2017-23, uh, which basically means any gross receipts. So if you had $1 of interest income in 2012, you would be disqualified from being considered a qualified small business for the 2017 tax year. So what is the benefit? Benefit to the qualified small business is annual election to specify the amount of credits that you want to apply against your social security tax or the 6.2% you know, 6, 6 of up to $250,000 each year. And any unused credit portion can be carried over to subsequent payroll filing quarters. Now, if you have previous R&D income tax credits that you're carrying forward, um, you cannot use those to offset payroll taxes. 
and then you cannot carry back credits uh, for using for payroll tax offset. So when does the, this benefit apply? It applies for tax years beginning on or after January 1, 2016. And you make an election on your 2017 entity return um, and and that will um, that you're that you're um, electing for the payroll tax offset, and you begin to use your payroll tax credits in the following calendar quarter, uh, Form 941. So if you file your your entity return in Q1, you can start using your payroll tax credits in Q2 uh, for payroll tax purposes. Um, the election cannot be made on an amended return, and then your your election to apply the R&D credits can be made up the up to five tax years. Um, so as long as you're qualified, you can use it five times and then that's, that's the limit. So how do you apply for this benefit? Uh, the election is made on form 6765 in this new section D um, that's part of your entity um, tax return filing. And this section specifies the amount of credit that you're electing to use as a payroll tax offset. The form 8974 is used to determine the amount of the quarterly credit, um, and it's attached It's attached to the form 941. And then on line 11 of 941 is where the credit is actually claimed. So let's go through an example. Uh, we have here, uh, what we have is carrying over from our previous example, we have 300,000 as a uh, research credit. And the, the most you can elect is 250,000 to offset your employer taxes. So you elect the full 250 and you, and, and you file your corporate return by March 31st. So that means you can use um, your credits for offset your Q2 employer taxes, which here in this example is 46,500. So you could reduce, um, you can offset that completely uh, by attaching 8974 to your form 941 for that quarter. That means your credit carry forward to Q3 would be 203,500. So that's the 250,000 uh, minus the 46,500. Uh, and you get to carry that forward uh, each quarter until you fully utilize it. Now, the difference between the 300,000 of your gross credit and the 250. Uh, you don't lose that. It just it carries over as an income tax credit so that you can use in the future if you're going to be paying any income taxes. So some of the factors to consider here is do you have taxable income or loss for 2017? Uh, in most cases with the startups, they're running you know, net operating losses. Uh, so you'll just you know, apply as much as you can uh, against, you know, for payroll tax purposes uh, to offset the payroll taxes. Uh, if you have taxable income and you're paying and you're paying tax, then most like income tax, you most likely you're going to want to just use the credits against income tax rather than apply them against payroll and then have to wait to get your, your payroll tax refund. And the next factor is should you consider making the 280C reduced credit election? Most of the time we see that you know, there would be no benefit, actually you'd be reducing your benefit by making a reduced credit election. The only time we've seen it um, being used is say your uh, credit amount is over 500,000. So you can make the reduced credit election, you'll still be well above the $250,000 payroll credit amount. Uh, you don't wanna do the reduced credit if you're just barely over the 250. So for example, say you do the reduced credit election and now you're at 260,000 of a, of a reduced credit. Uh, and the IRS then later comes in and they say, we're gonna adjust your credit by 40,000. So now all of a sudden it drops you below the 250 and now you have to amend payroll tax returns. You gotta pay penalties interest. So, so in most cases, you'll just take the gross credit, but unless you're your, 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 your gross credit is, or even after you take the reduced credit, you're still far enough above the, the 250. So maybe you're in 300,000 to 400,000 range after taking the reduced credit. And then the, the timing of filing your 2017 return is, is very important because that starts, the sooner that you file that, the sooner you can start taking your credits in the next, 
the next quarter after filing the return. So you file by March 31st, you can start taking your payroll credits in Q2. If you file by April 15th, you're in Q2, so then you start your credits in Q3. And if you wait all the way until October 15th, now you're in Q4, you wouldn't start your payroll credits until Q1 of the following year. Uh, and the last factor to consider, can you reduce your payroll tax deposits in lieu of receiving a refund? <clears throat> yes, that would be preferred if your payroll service provider allows it. Last year, uh, the payroll service companies and POs, they were just trying to get a handle on, on this process. Uh, so many of, most of them didn't allow uh, companies to reduce their payroll deposits. So most of the companies had to file um, and wait for the refunds. You know, they had to continue making their payroll tax deposits and then file for a refund. Uh, this year, I, I'm seeing more of the of the payroll service companies uh, allow companies to reduce their payroll tax deposits. Uh, however, they may charge a fee for this, so you just have to see what their um, you know what what their what their process is. So. Uh, I had, uh, yeah, I skipped over the how does your payroll service provider or PEO process the credit? So, yeah, so you want to make sure you coordinate with um, with them as soon as possible just to let them know that you are, you will be applying for these credits and find out their instructions and the timing and what information they need in order to uh, process these credits um, on your behalf. So that's that's uh, that's that's the end of the presentation um, awesome. part of it. I have a I have a couple of follow ups just here, if you don't mind, David. Um, I uh, to those of you on the line here, um, I tried to get David to rename this presentation "Free Money." Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of good things that come along with this credit, and if you if you or your uh, or your companies um, qualify for this and you're not taking advantage of the credit, uh, there's a lot of things that we can do to help you out with this. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you just a little bit about you know Armenino and how we could do that. Um, I will. Uh, certainly let you guys email us if you want to if you want to talk to us about it but we can certainly help you with all of the things that you just kind of went through so you don't actually have to do the calculations and everything um, you can let David do that um, so I just wanted to point that out but I did want to I did want to just follow up with a question David um, can you kind of clarify what the difference is between a PEO and a non PEO um, sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, you know, a, a non-PO is just a, your typical payroll service provider that uh, is like a paychex or an ADP, and they just process the payroll on your behalf. Uh, and 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 so then when you receive your employees receive their W twos, it says the name of your company on them, and it's your nine forty one that you're filing. Uh, and and so in in that case. Uh, when you apply for these these uh, refunds, the IRS is going to be sending you a check um, back to you directly. Whereas in the case of a PO, which is a a PO stands for a professional employer organization. So these are these are companies like Trinet or Insperity or even ADP Total Source has a has a, a PO model uh, that they are the employer of record for for payroll tax purposes. So when, when say, Trinet, for instance, files each quarter, they file one, one 941 for all their companies, and the name of the company on the 941 is Trinet. So when they, when they file for these credits on behalf of their clients, they receive the refund directly from the IRS, and then what they do is then they, they apply those credits to the company's next payroll run. So it's a little bit, you have to look at your, your, your reports and kind of see, try to find out when, when those credits are coming through. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to identify than if you just receive a check directly back from the IRS. And there's a little bit more of a time lag when you use a PO. So what we found is, you know, with a non-PO, you're getting your refunds within one to three months. But with the, with the POs, it seems it's 
like three to five months, it's taking them longer. So, uh, okay. and then I think one one other piece that might be of interest to the folks on the call here is just you know how do you how do you kind of account for the the the, the credit? Like, is it where where is it in the books of the company? Yeah. So it's so there's different different ways to account for it. Uh, you know, and for, if you're looking for tax provision purposes, uh, there's some guidance out there that, uh, that 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 says that you can you can book the receivable. Say say you have the full 250, you book the 250 as a as a as a payroll tax or a refund receivable at the end of the year, and and then you the other side of the entry, the credit entry would be you know other income. Uh, but you know that's just yeah you know, that's for you know accounting purposes. So but for you know, companies that just aren't doing a provision or don't not non-GAAP, they're just sort of doing their own internal accounting. Most likely, they're not going to be booking anything, and they'll just as soon as they get those refund checks, they're just going to offset payroll tax expense. And and so what you have to keep in mind, which is very important, is those um, those expenses or are, are still deductible for tax purposes. So there should be a book tax adjustment. Uh, that is allowing you to still deduct the 250, uh, even though you, for accounting purposes, you're just sort of you're putting it to other income or you're putting it to offsetting your payroll tax expenses. And and the reason why is that when we did it, when I showed you the calculation earlier, that you have to um, reduce your expenses or you have to reduce your credit. You're already reducing uh, the expenses for the amount of the credit. So just receiving the refund and reducing your expenses again would be double, double, double reduction of your, of your deduction. So that's, uh, so that's why they allow you to still deduct it for tax purposes. Okay. And then here's, here's a good question. Um, is this, is this a, a study or, you know, is it an analysis? I mean, a lot of people kind of get the idea that an R and D credit study is a full blown study. Can you kind of just touch on that? we don't have a ton of time here, but I think it's important. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And this is this is quick. It's, it's um, you know, what we've found is that with the startup companies we work with, they don't want to pay for a full study. You know, they don't want someone to spend time documenting how they're doing uh, qualified research. Almost by definition, they're, you know, they, they, they can easily support that they're doing qualified research. Um, we help them go through the four part test quickly and then we we um, do the costing analysis. So what we what we call it is a credit analysis and we issue a, a, a eight to 10 re page report, um, which kind of goes through how the company qualifies. But it's not a full study, which is what we've seen is a binder that's issued by some of the companies. And it's just essentially it's, it's a copy and paste job of you know, the internal revenue code provisions. And it, it doesn't it doesn't give much value uh, to start. So startups, we understand, want to conserve as much cash as possible. So we've come up with a way to do an analysis that is a good cost benefit to them. Um, and but still go in and help them maximize the credits that they're um, that, that they're eligible for, help document it to the IRS uh, regulations and or requirements, and then also help them through this process of getting these credits um, through their payroll service companies to properly credit them on their payroll tax returns. Cool. Well, I don't see any other questions here. So um, I think I'm going to turn it over to our hosts here and let them kind of close out for us. Awesome. Thank you both so much, David and Chris. Um, and thank you to everyone on the line with us. Just want to let you all know to look out for an email from me um, and it will include the contact information of our presenters today so that way you can email them with any um, lingering questions. It'll also include a webinar recording from today's webinar and also information on future webinars because we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.